Today's uh, New Testament reading comes from Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 12. You could follow along in the Pew Bible on page 166 to 167. Hear now the word of God. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor any ear has ever heard, nor the human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. The word of God for the people of God. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3. And in the bulletin it says until verse 10, but we all look like we're in pretty good health this morning, so we're going to go ahead and just read the entire chapter. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, Eli, you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you, go lie down. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. So Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you, please go lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up again and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And if the Lord calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expedited by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell his vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Don't hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me, of all that he told you. 
So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to God. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh for the Lord revealed God's self to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. Please pray with me. God, you speak to us in so many ways. We pray now that you silence every voice within us but your own and startle us with your truth. Amen. Has anyone heard this story before about Samuel? No one? Cheryl, Cheryl's so good. She just, and she's like, yeah, no one else. I've, and also I play words with friends, so... I try. We should talk about that later. I can't get it right on my phone. Um, right, lots of times. So, and if you haven't heard it before, that's okay too. As a person who's gone through the call process to become a minister and all those things, this passage is used a lot when people are ordained or when they go through the candidacy process and they hit certain points. This scripture comes up to point to a call of God because this, this is a very good story for that. That makes it very plain. But I want to look at a little closer the relationship between Samuel and Eli. Now, does anybody know how Samuel ended up living in the temple? Does anyone know? Sort of, yeah. So we can't really talk about Samuel without talking about his mama, right? So Hannah was Samuel's mother, and she had prayed for years and years and years to have a baby. And if any one of you have ever dealt with infertility or any kind of loss dealing with children, you know how hard that can be. And then she became pregnant, and she told God, if everything goes well, which is my own paraphrase, I will give this baby to you to serve you. So she really did offer up her, for, her firstborn child to the church. So she has baby Samuel. And she takes baby Samuel to the temple. She takes him to the priest, whose name was Eli, and gives the baby to Eli. Now, we don't know if Eli had to go to parenting classes or had a home check or anything like that. It doesn't tell us. It just says that he received the baby. And what a great sacrifice on Hannah's part to give this baby and not even to know what his life was going to be turned into. Can you imagine just bringing a baby to the pastor? I'll keep that baby as long as it's good. As soon as it needs its diaper changed, I'm probably going to hand it back. Allison, if you're watching, I'll change Sam's diaper anytime. So then this priest has this baby. And they're in this temple. And in those days, they believed that God lived where? Do you know? Yes, in the temple, in a very specific place in the temple. Not the Ark of Noah, but the Ark of the Covenant, right? So there was this big, um, beautiful box sort of thing inside the Holy of Holies. So if you've ever been to a Jewish worship service or seen a picture of what a temple looks like, there are kind of different layers. And then there's this one area where only the priest can go back into. And that's, that's where, at this time, that's where they believed God resided, was in this Holy of Holies. And so Samuel's job was to sleep right there. So he slept right by the ark. And Eli actually slept right by the door of the temple. So it provided some protection for Samuel, but he slept right by the door of the temple. And it also tells us that Eli, uh, that Samuel 
He hadn't been to confirmation class yet. He didn't know, he didn't know God. I mean, he was serving God under Eli, but Samuel had not had any personal encounter with God. But God reached out to Samuel before Samuel could reach out to God. And one of the ways that we see that in our tradition that I love so much is when we baptize a young child that can't even speak yet and demonstrate that love of God that is so encompassing. There's no need for us to even say a word. And God is right there all over us. And I love what we say about baptism, which is that it is a visible sign of the invisible grace that we have received. So Samuel has grown. And he is sleeping by the Ark of the Covenant. And it says that the lamp has not gone out which is good because that's a sign of God's spirit. So that, that would be treacherous if that happened. And it also tells us that Eli had gotten older because his eyes had grown dim, couldn't see very well anymore. And so Samuel is asleep, right? Sleeping, so is Eli. And I may be projecting some things onto Eli that Eli might say, no, that's not true. I didn't feel that way. But Eli's not here, is he? So he was sleeping by the door of the temple. And Samuel hears his voice, his name being called. Well, there's only the two of them, so who else is going to call his name, right? Because if anybody else did and there's only two of you, that gets real creepy real fast. So Samuel gets up, he goes to Eli, he's like, yes, Eli, here I am. And Eli says, this is where I'm projecting onto Eli, and Eli says, will you please go back to bed? You've already had a drink of water. I've read you that story five times. You don't need more socks. Like, you know, whatever that is. But Eli says, go back to bed. It wasn't me. And then it happens again and again. And Eli says, please go to sleep. I'm tired. I'm older now. I need more rest, Samuel. But then Eli realizes what's going on. And then when Samuel comes to him again, Eli says, okay, I figured it out. It's God. Go back to bed. And when God calls you again, you say, I'm your servant and I'm listening. Now, if I were Samuel and I'd never met this God, I'd be a little nervous. My whole life has been spent in the temple. And so I haven't seen a lot of other people. My life has been very different than other people because I've been in the temple. Doesn't say Samuel was nervous at all. I'd I'd be a little nervous. I also have a friend who says when a child is baptized and they cry... That is perhaps the most perfect response to being called into Christian community are some tears. Tears of joy and tears of, oh my goodness, what's just happened to me? So Samuel hears God's voice. And he says, here I am, God. But then God proceeds to tell Samuel some not good news. So you've never met God. Your mentor has just told you to go lay down and respond, okay? And not only that, it's not just a chat like, hey, Samuel, I'm God. It's really nice to meet you. You've done a wonderful job in the temple so far. I've got, you know, a couple of uh, certificates just for showing up. You've done a great job. Good try, good try. No, that's not what God says. God says, Samuel, this is what Eli's house has been doing. They've blasphemed my name. They've done this. They've done that. They've done this. I'm really angry with them. And they're in big trouble. You're going to have to tell Eli. And if I was Samuel, I'd be like, I don't know, God. That's above my pay grade. You go tell Eli. But that's not what happened. So Samuel goes back to his mentor 
to this person who has raised him his entire life, right? Entire life has been both mother and father to him. Eli, for all intents and purposes, was a single parent. So he goes to Eli and kind of has probably a similar response, like I would, which is sort of, um, good morning, Eli. Yeah, God did show up. Mm, it was real interesting. Anyway, uh, it's sunny outside. Do you want to go play? And then Eli says, uh, Samuel, you really should tell me what God said. And if I was Samuel, I'd be like, no, don't worry about it. You're, you're getting older anyway. You may not, you know, whatever. You may not really care about it. It's not such a big deal. But that's out of Samuel's own anxiety, or it would be out of my own anxiety instead of what God was calling me to do. But how awful your first call is to go give somebody like really bad news, like, oh, God's so mad at you and says he's going to be mad forever. I'm looking at the lovely shining faces of the deacons who would never do something like that, like ever. And so, say, and so then Eli says, look, you better do it, because if you don't, then I'm going to pray that God does just as much and maybe worse to you than to me. All right, then. Eli's getting a little salty. Fine, if I'm Samuel, I'll tell you what God said. I don't know. Samuel probably didn't have that kind of an attitude, but I would probably get it. I'll tell you what God said. And then he tells him. And Eli does not have a big emotional response. He just says, well, if that's what God wants to do, let God do it. So, if you've ever had a mentor or someone who helped nurture you or taught you things, that'd be pretty scary to have to go tell this person that God was mad at them and, according to that story, was going to be mad forever. Good grief. Somebody stopped by my office and they're like, hey, how's it going? I know this is sort of weird for Presbyterian Tara, but... Um, God spoke to me, and uh, it wasn't good. It was not good at all. Like, if, the, if there was a person who had to do that, I would like to think that would feel hard for them. Maybe not for everyone. So Samuel has to go to this person who's protected him his entire life and give him some awful news out of obedience to God. Have any of you ever had a mentor or someone who was significant in your life? Yeah. Did anybody see the the sermon uh, in the royal wedding that the Episcopal pastor preached? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Was that not the best ever? Woo! And I wasn't going to mention it because I preached on that passage a few weeks ago, and I thought, oh, I hope they don't remember that because I did not preach like that. (laughs) But one of the things he said in an interview, because he's just going at it, and I'm looking at my phone, and I'm like, amen, and what's that thing? I'm trying to remember when I was a little girl growing up in the Pentecostal church, we had a thing where we'd be like, let's give Jesus a, and I'm like, was that like clap off, clap on, I don't remember. And then I had a friend who was like, no, 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 it's a hand clap. And I'm like, oh, that's right, yeah, let's give Jesus a hand clap. So I was glad I figured that out before I came to church this morning and did. Let's give Jesus a clap off. Yeah, clap on, clap off, right? And when he talked about love and fire and all of those things, those people who become so integral into our lives, Do that. They can bring God's fire. He also said what I thought was most interesting. When he was in an interview, the person questioning him said, how did that go? Because I'm sure you're used to getting big responses from your congregation. And if any of you have seen this sermon, it was preached at at the royal wedding. And the Anglicans and the Presbyterians were... um, kind of the same branches on the same tree. So they're not too far away from us. So they were very 
uh, stoic in a sense. You, you can see some of them starting to get really uncomfortable. You know, and, a, and you see a couple of heads with really big hats that go down like this. And does anybody know who David Beckham is? Soccer player. Anyway, it pans over to David Beckham, and he's like, did he just really say that? I'm like, yeah, I did. He gave Jesus a clap off. Yeah. But one of the things he said was that the interviewer asked him was he said, no, I didn't get big responses, but that's okay. I look for the amen in their eyes. And I thought, oh, that's good. That's so good. I'm going to start doing that. But luckily, my congregation will respond because sometimes I just wait. Just wait. Yeah. So, who's had a good mentor? Melissa? Yep. Does anybody have a story? A short one? No one? All right, well, I'm looking for the amen in your eyes. Yeah, oh, good. It, good, thank you. Amen. Just, amen. Just clap off, clap on, right? So... When we have this person who has nurtured us, who we have loved so deeply, we must be so obedient to God to go and deliver this news. But you know what? That's just the beginning of Samuel's story. Oh, my goodness. If you read on, it talks about Samuel's life and how he becomes one of the most prominent figures during that time period. And this was during the period when there was no king. And people just listened for God. And then once Samuel got older, do you know what the people started saying? We want a king, we want a king, we want a king. Depending on where you are and what the political climate is, you might regret your decision for wanting a king. And that's what happened to the Israelites. Because they got a king, but that's a whole other story. And I don't want to preach two sermons at once, because then I'll run out. So Samuel grows into this prophet and judge and military leader for God. But his first step was to deliver some news that wasn't happy to the person who had raised him. And Eli had nurtured Samuel to listen for God's voice. Even in that short amount of time, that one night, Eli says to Samuel, it's God. Go back and listen. And I know for me, without those faithful people who have spoken into my life or continue to do it, I wouldn't be who I am. I'm really fortunate that I have several people who I can call when I need to hash things out with. And I have one in particular who is so good about listening no matter matter what it is. He'll listen. And if things, if I'm telling him about something that went horribly, because I don't know, some of you may have this as well. I have a strong inner critic, I found out when we did psychological testing to prepare for ordination, which just is a little fun word to say, like I'm really good at beating myself up. So if something's gone wrong or I've missed something, oh, I can be much harder on myself than anybody else can. And I'll do it real quick too, unless I keep it in check. So to have this pastor who knows that about me, So when I'll start telling the story about what happened or what I did wrong or what I missed or whatever, and I'm fully into this, oh, my gosh, I'm such a bad pastor, whatever. And he's just like, stop. He's just like, stop. It's done, right? Yeah, it's over. Like, just stop because nobody cares. Nobody cares about the whining. No one cares. He's not that harsh, but it's essentially his point. You know, it's over. It's okay. And then then a lot of times he's just like, good try. All right? You survived your first year. You're, You're a first call pastor in a parish. Good try for you. Good try. And then I'm like, all right, Pete said good try. So I'm good. I'm good. And then I have other people that I can call as well who speak into my life in a similar way. And you know how it's good to have multiple people because then you always have that one friend that will get mad with you. 
You know what I'm talking about? When you can call and tell them something, and you're like, oh, I can't believe I let this happen, or whatever it is, and they're like, you don't even have to say it. You can just be like, blah, 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 blah. And they can tell from the tone of your voice, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Right back at you. I'll get mad with you. And those folks are really important to have. And when we don't have those folks in our lives, we can start feeling really lonely. I know I can. And so what an amazing gift it was that Hannah gave. And what an amazing gift Samuel's life was to the rest of Israel. So for those people in your life who have nurtured you, if you're able to this week, give them a, give them a call or whatever, a note, email, whatever, smoke signal. Just, you know, I'm thinking of you. Thanks for the times you, I'll just say it for myself, stuck with me when uh, I was a really naive seminary graduate and Pete, this pastor, would say to me, okay, when you go into ministry, you're going to have some times when A, B, and C happens. And when these things happen, here's what you do. And I'd be like, okay, I mean, that may be your experience, but um, there's a lot of differences between us, and no one would ever do that or do that or do that. That's like, that must be just all about you. Can't imagine that. You'd have to deal with your own stuff. I didn't say that out loud. I'd just be like, "Uh uh-huh, okay, sure. Yeah, but guess what? He's right, and I had to send him an email at one point that just said, you were right about everything, and that was all I could write. I had to, like, bite my tongue, so I was like, oh, it's true. He was right about, well, pretty much all of it. And there was one time when I called him, and I said, uh, here's what's happening, and then he said, okay. He said, I'm going to tell you some things, and you tell me if they're right. So he went down this list of of things. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's right. Actually, all those things are right. How'd you know? And he goes, because I've been doing this for 30 years. So mentors are a gift. And being a mentor is a privilege. Has anybody mentored anyone before? We can mentor people unofficially all the time. Lori's my mentor. She could tell you things, but don't ask her because she won't tell you. She's like a lockbox. That's what I hear. Yeah, and so mentoring people in church in the different ways that we can, even if it's just sitting next to somebody in coffee hour, you don't have to have an agenda. You just sit next to somebody. And if you have a really bad message from God to share with them, I'll leave that between the two of you. You can do that. But what a great gift Hannah gave. And what a great gift to Samuel that he had Eli. And Samuel, and what a great gift Samuel's life was to Israel and to us. I promise he did a lot of really big stuff, but I'm trying not to talk about it today. But you can go home and read it, it's really good. Please pray with me. Gracious God who nurtures us, who keeps us safe, who guides us, help us be reminded as we go from this place the times when people have done that for us and the times when we've done that for others. In your name we pray, amen.